Hello, everybody. Hi. How are you guys doing tonight? How are you feeling? Thank you guys so much for being here for the first month of this three-month residency of the Ciceretta series. How many people here know who Ciceretta Jones was? No one. Awesome. I mean, not awesome, but like awesome for me telling you who she is or who she was, rather. So this series is named after Ciceretta Jones, who was a 19th century opera singer, and she was a black woman and was singing all around the world, and she was regarded as the premier vocalist. She was the highest earning African American of her time, and despite the fact that she was traveling around the world and had medals from all of these different dignitaries, was the first African American to sing on Carnegie Hall stage, she was not able to get a contract from any opera houses because of the fact that she was black. But because she didn't get any contracts, she decided to make her own vaudeville show where she invited other black members to come and perform with dignity because at the time, they only had minstrel shows. And obviously minstrel shows were incredibly humiliating. And so she decided to make her own platform to give her fellow people of color an opportunity to perform on stage with dignity and with pride. And it also allowed herself to have a place to perform her opera music and you know sing with pride. This is somebody who was traveling around the world for about 20 years and unfortunately, her mother got sick and she decided to leave show business and she ended up dying practically penniless without a gravestone or anything and she more or less w was left forgotten. And it wasn't until about two summers ago, the New York Times did an overlooked series that I got an opportunity to read about her and she was incredibly inspiring. Just the fact that before, you know, the idea of FUBU or for us, by us was mainstream in popular culture. She had taken it upon herself to create a space for fellow people of color to perform. And I was very inspired by that when creating this show. And I decided to take it one step further and make it all about women of color. So thank you guys so much for being here at the Green Space. I'm very grateful to WNYC for allowing me to host this show once again. I did the first one in January at Come On Everybody, but this time I'm playing more like MC vibes, you know? You'll get a little taste of something later, but this is gonna be the only one where that happens, so feel real special about it, okay? <laughs> but yeah, so that's who Ciceretta Jones was. This is the Ciceretta series. Unfortunately, there are no recorded anything of her because it was before recording like happened so we just have to imagine it in our brains and you know I imagine that it was you know just like a songbird you know very beautiful very gorgeous but so I'm joined by a lot of really incredible women tonight the first one you've got you're gonna get some laughs you're gonna get some comedy we've got Marie Faustin who she has appeared on Broad City MTV's Girl Code and co-hosted Vice Live um, you can check her out on her podcast, The Unofficial Expert with Sydney Washington, who, if you haven't seen them, they are hilarious. I actually saw them at the Green Space a couple months ago and almost peed my pants. Um, not that you needed to know that bit of information. Um, and they'll be doing a live taping as part of the New York Comedy Festival this Saturday at Union Hall. So if you like what you hear, and if you want to hear more jokes, Saturday, Union Hall. But thank you guys so much for being here. Are you guys ready for the show? Yeah. Yes. And remember, remember when that, that was good, that was good, that was good. I asked you a question and you did some woo-woos. All right? So remember, that's how we're gonna do it from here on out. Just like that. You guys gonna you guys ready? Yeah. That's more like it. Okay, re ready everybody. This is Marie Faustin. Welcome to the stage. Yes, I wore my finest peacock sweater for y'all today. Are you guys doing good? Yeah. Okay, some of y'all did not respond, but uh, we'll do, oh wow, that's me when I had hair. Wow! So I shaved all of my hair off two months ago. Uh, thank you so much, so brave, so beautiful, so, so bold. Uh, <laughs> but I used to have a lot of hair, like it was like uh, the shape of Hey Arnold's head. 
and it would get caught on people's glasses when they hugged me, and it would get caught in the train doors. I have really good posture, so one day I got on the train, and I heard, stand clear to closing doors, please, and then doo-doo, and then I couldn't move. And I was like, it's because my hair was in the doors. And I was like, oh, it's fine. The doors are going to open eventually. And then the train went express. So I was like, I guess I'm going to the Bronx. <laughs> my hair got caught on the buttons of this dude's blazer once. And I was like, I guess we going to work together. And we did. And now I have a 401k, OK? OK, some of y'all don't have that. A lot of poor people in here tonight. I don't. Uh, but I wanted to look good for you guys today, so I put on some lipstick. You see it? Okay, some of you guys don't like it. Don't worry about it. Um, I read recently that our ideal lip shade is the color of our nipples. Have y'all heard this? You, ha you have? The way you laughed? The way you choked on your spit? You have? She was like... <coughs> <laughs> anyway, this is what color my nipples are. Ay <laughs> okay, uh... So I went to MAC to get this nipple lipstick today. And while I was in there, I heard somebody say, young man, please stop stealing in here. And I was like, they so busy watching him, they don't even see me taking these lipsticks. <laughs> I was the only person in the store. I don't know, I feel like I look like a sexy boy now. You know, I, I just bleached my hair um, a week ago. And I walked in and I was like, make me look like Jada Pinkett Smith. And the hairdresser was like, Jaden Smith, say no more, fam. So this is just what I look like now. Are you guys having a good year? 2019 is almost over. Make some noise if you've, you've had a good year. Oh, the way you are groaning, sis, what happened? I mean, I mean, that, it's been years. That didn't just happen in 2019. She's like, ugh. Uh, I'm having a great year, phenomenal even. The year started, I booked an international TV show. And thank you so much, one person. And it's too late, don't clap for me now. <laughs> and international television show, and my mother was like, I don't want you to get too famous. I don't want you to get selena And I was like, Qua? Uh, what? And she was like, I don't want you to get beady beady bump bumped. And I was like, I was like, that's why I do this. If I don't get murdered by a fan in 10 years, why did I come here tonight? Okay, I could have stayed home. I just moved into a one bedroom apartment, okay, by myself. Oh, thriving. I almost didn't come to the show tonight because I'm just, I'm, I'm butt naked every day. I'm just home with no clothes on all day long. Just like, look at all my things. <laughs> And I just moved into like a really gentrified area, so white people. And, you know, I have three really big windows, they face the street, and I like, this is the weird time of the year where the, in the sun, it's hot. You're like, woo, I should pull my titties out. Like, you're excited. And then you cross the street into the shade, and you're like, it is, fr I can see my breath, right? So I never know what to put on when I leave my house. I like to look out onto the street and see what my community is wearing. But what I learned, and what y'all know, is white people don't get cold. So I look out the window and see a white dude in like a tuxedo vest and corduroy flip-flops and a ski mask, and I'm like, is it cold? Or is it hot? So I have to stand in my window until somebody who looks like me walks by. Do you know how many people look like me? Literally none. I haven't been outside in a week. <laughs> I'm just in the window like, what? There are no black girls that look like black boys outside today. <laughs> Just me. What is this on the table? You bought a juice box from home? Okay. BYOB, sis. <laughs> anyway, so the show that I booked at the beginning of the year got canceled. It was bad. Nobody was watching it. Don't cry for me, Argentina. And <laughs> nobody, I would call my mother and be like, you know, did you watch the show? It just came, and my mother would be like, oh, I was watching My 600 Pound Life. <laughs> and I'd be like, well, your 120 pound daughter was just on TV. And she'd be like, well, maybe if you weren't so skinny, the show wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> <laughs> so the show got canceled because people weren't watching it, but people were watching it somewhere because two separate couples reached out to me. The first couple was like, 
hey, Marie, my, my boyfriend and I are huge fans of your show. We love you. Anywhere in the world you want to go, we will fly you out on vacation with us. Wow. <laughs> Look at all the people who don't have passports. Wow. <laughs> my friends were like, oh, they're trying to invite you to a threesome. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, no, they trying to Natalie Holloway me. <laughs> I was like, I'm not gonna go, right? Also with us, how does that work? You gonna fly me out and then you gonna pick me up at the airport and we have to make threesome small talk? No. So the second couple was like, yo Marie, no flight required, we're in New Jersey. <laughs> and I was like, sir, I would rather get murdered on a beach than get my ass ate in New Jersey. I gotta die with sand in my booty hole, you know? <laughs> That's gross! And anybody in here from New Jersey? Clap. Wow. So brave. You guys still live, you still live in New Jersey? Yeah, no, you got pearls on. There's no way you live in New Jersey. Do you still live in New Jersey? Oh, see how fast you shut that down? Do, you, you're from Chicago, but you live where now? Ah, that's still New Jersey. Um, <laughs> That's like people who are like, I'm from the city. And you're like, where? And they're like, Long Island. That's not the city. <laughs> She's, she was like, I'm from Chicago though. That doesn't make a difference. <laughs> are there any questions about anything that I've said thus far? <laughs> so on my way here today, I was on the train and the lights flickered and then they went off. <laughs> and everybody from New York was like, <gasps> but we kept it moving, you know? We kept it calm. My phone is at 78% battery. I'm good. <laughs> the dude sitting across from me must, I, he must be from Chicago or New Jersey or something. Cause he started freaking out. He starts screaming. He was like, no, nah! like screaming. What is that artwork? The masterpiece, the who? What is that called? Home Alone, exactly. Screaming. <laughs> he threw his crossword puzzle. He threw his body on the floor. His AirPods went flying, a homeless dude put them in his nose. It was just drama. <laughs> and then the lights came back on and he got back up and sat down like we didn't just watch him have a meltdown. <laughs> but people are traumatized from the blackout over the summer. There was a blackout. There were people who were trapped on the train in the dark for two hours. I feel like it went dark and all the rats were like, it's lit, like. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine being trapped on a New York City subway in the dark for two hours? Can we think about all the people who were on the way home to poop when that happened? <laughs> Can we think about the fallen? Everybody in this room has rushed home to poop before. And the people who aren't laughing have pooped on themselves. <laughs> Look at all the leaky butt people in here tonight. Just gross. We've all been out and then you'll just be like, huh. <laughs> Oh, I can't poop here. <laughs> I gotta go home and get butt naked. <laughs> Some of your best poops, naked. You kick that squatty potty to the side. It's the white folks in here, y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, and you know, you'll be fine, but the closer you get to your house, the closer the poop gets to your jeans. Cause you'll be, you'll be like, doo -doo -doo, and then you, like, you caught, cross some imaginary line and you're like, no! You get to your front door, you're putting your front door key and like you are diffusing a bomb. You'll be like, because you can't be the person that poops in your doorway. The people in your building are going to talk about you at the mailboxes. They're going to be like, you know, 3A is nasty. <laughs> she had on shorts that day. She gross. Wow, a lot of you guys have pooped on yourselves. It's crazy. Jersey, have you ever pooped on yourself? Chicago? You know, you got the mittens on in the wintertime. You can't really get the key in the door. Don't lie to me, this is a safe space. People do what? Immune to the cold? Oh, please. <laughs> Immune? How many New Yorkers born and raised in here right now? Clap. Have y'all gotten used to the cold? No! no! <laughs> I feel like it's getting worse. Or better. I mean, I guess it depends on, you know, global warming. Um, but. I didn't mean to bring the mood down. I'm having, a, I'm having a good year. I'm excited to be here. I am trying to be a better person. I'm lying, I'm still gonna steal. But <laughs> <laughs> I 
Are you guys on dating apps? Clap if you're on any of the dating apps. <laughs> Just everybody else is too busy swiping in here to clap? Any app could be a dating app if you use it properly. <laughs> Literally any app. You're hungry, you order some seamless. If the delivery dude comes, if he has all his teeth, boom, that's a dating app. <laughs> you get in an Uber pool, there's a dude in the back seat. He's poor, it's a pool. But if he has all his teeth, boom, that's a dating app. Airbnb is a dating app if you never leave. <laughs> this is our house. Men are too confident, ladies, and I think we need to be meaner to them. Uh, I'm blaming all the women in here because you know I'm doing my due diligence to shut men down. I don't even say bless you when men sneeze. I'd be like, huh! <laughs> Sir, you almost got that on my croissant. <laughs> we need to date how men date, okay? Like, stop dating men because they're nice. That's literally the dumbest reason you could date somebody. Date them for what they can do for you, okay? I went on a date with a dude once because he had a printer at his house. <laughs> he unmatched me, I still print there. Anyway, you guys have been awesome. Have a good night, enjoy the rest of the show, bye. Give it up for Marie, oh. Give it up for Marie, everybody. Is this on? Hello. Hi. That was very funny. I don't know about you guys, but I was backstage cracking up. I'm gonna bring Melissa on while she sets up, while I talk about her as if she is not directly behind me. So, Melissa McMillan, it's this beautiful woman right here. Um, we do have the same alliteration in our name. Uh, Madison McFerrin, Melissa McMillan, and we have the same middle name, so this isn't weird at all, okay? Um, both mixed women with white mothers. Uh, you know, it just, it just gets real creepy. Yeah. <laughs> but Melissa is a singer-songwriter based in Brooklyn and co-founder of the Femme Jam Band, which these ladies are also a part of. <laughs> Looking like they came straight out of a Skittles box right now, you know? Um, they are also, it, she's also in the Resistance Revival Chorus, which if you guys have not seen that, they are incredible. Check them out. They wear all white and look heavenly while they're doing it. Um, the next Femme Jam Band session is November 19th at Come On Everybody. I highly recommend going. They always have a cute little theme happening, and they sound incredible. So, ladies and gentlemen, Melissa McMillan. Hello, thank you for that wonderful introduction. So happy to be here. Um, I'm going to play some of my music for you today, and we're going to start with a song called Ain't What I'm Used To. Um, it's something that I wrote um, based on some, a story that a friend had told me that she was in this relationship that was really tumultuous, but it's like it was fiery and passionate. And she's with this new guy, and everything's good. Everything is right, but it doesn't feel normal to her because she's used to this other craziness. So <laughs> this is Ain't What I'm Used To. Flowers just because Candles, the ones you know I love Kisses, to let me know You think I'm a treasure and you're down for whatever All these mistakes I made But you're the one After years of making all my worst decisions How to release my inhibitions It ain't easy Cause it ain't what I'm used to Oh, oh. good love is new Oh, oh, oh. oh it ain't what I'm used to Good love is new All these questions Left unanswered 
There was a prototype of this ego And pride became a way of life And I couldn't seem to get it right Insecurity, oh it followed me An unwelcome shadow Even on a cloudy day Showed me a better way, but still it ain't easy. Cause it ain't what I'm used to. Oh, good love is new. This good love is new Oh, how can I handle This thing I've never known When you've only known love that's fleeting Real love can't be misleading When pain is a constant Relief can feel so strange I student of conditional love but you taught me how to rise above still it ain't what I'm used to oh, oh. good love is new oh, oh, oh. oh it ain't what I'm used to This good love is new. Oh, 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 it ain't what I'm used to. This good love is new. Oh, this good love is new. Oh, oh, oh it ain't what I'm used to. No, no, this good. Give it up for Miranda Joan and Camille Trust on the vocals. Would it be possible for me to just move this back just a little bit? So I can, yeah, there we go. I feel like I'm, I can't hear the monitors. Okay. How are y'all doing? Good? Good? Thank you so much for being here. This next one we're going to do is off my first EP. This is called All My Love. Can't give up. Don't 
this next one we're going to do is called Stranger. It's uh, the last single that I released. Um, and it's about, you know, sort of waking up one day, or maybe it's over the course of a day, a week, a month, a few years, you realize this person that you've co created this life with is now a stranger to you. So that's what this is about. Sorry, was it? One more. Okay, okay. So we're going to do one more. This song is called I Will Follow. Um, it's a song I wrote. I kind of wanted to write a love song for just um, for the sun and for like all things light and beautiful because um, I felt like, you know, we need more positivity and more light in the world. So this is a song about chasing after light. Chasing dreams and 
daylight I had a vision of ecstasy It came to me in sunlight Oh, I will follow where you go That's where I'll go Oh, I will follow where you go That's where I'll go Oh, I will follow where you go That's where I'll go Oh, I will follow where you go Madison McFerrin. So good to be here. Thank you. Melissa McMillan, everybody. Yes. Give it up for those harmonies. Ooh. Sounding like butter. Mm, Love that. Also, the color coordination happening is just on point. How are you guys doing? How are you feeling? Are you guys enjoying the evening thus far? Yes? Good, okay, so now we are going into the conversation portion of the evening, which is one of the bigger differentiating factors from the last time I did this to this time. I'm gonna be, you know, pretending to be Oprah for five minutes while we have a nice conversation. This month's conversation is with Naj Austin, who is the founder of Ethel's Club. Um, Has anybody heard about Ethel's Club yet? Yes, okay, yes, all right. Very enthusiastic, loving it. Um, So Naj created Ethel's Club in response to an overwhelming lack of representation she saw in social clubs and co-working spaces, i.e. the wing, we work, all of those places, you know? So she was previously head of growth and co-founder of Compound, a real estate management firm in New York City, and the Ethel's Club just opened up yesterday. So give it up for Naj Austin, everybody. Hi. Hello. How you doing tonight? I am good. <laughs> nice. A little tired, but I'm great. I can so imagine you had a, a very filled weekend. You had the release or the, the launch, launch parties. Yeah. yeah. We had launch parties for our investors, then for press, then for friends and family. Um, And then we opened up for members yesterday morning at 9 a.m. Congratulations. Thank you. That's amazing. So, just some questions for you. Sure. So how did Ethel's Club come to be, and how did you cultivate your team? Ethel's Club was born out of what I saw was a giant void um, and many sort of 
gathering spaces. Um, they're not called co-working spaces, but I think that those spaces could also be places like Starbucks where freelancers go and work. Um, a lot of those spaces I felt were unsafe towards people of color. I felt that people of color were not adequately represented in those spaces. So while looking sort of at the market, I saw that there were no social spaces and or wellness clubs designed with people of color in mind. So I started Ethel's Club this past uh, January 2018, um, looking to fix that problem. Um, I found my team uh, through basic sort of social media strategy. They found us as consumers and came to us and wanted to help us build the company. Awesome. So who is Ethel's Club's primary client and what are they doing in their day to day? Like who, who is this character who's coming to the Ethel's Club? Sure. Um, it really varies, and it's very funny because it's only been day two, so I'm like, I don't totally know all of them yet. <laughs> I do. Um, but, but most of them are people who have um, a deep interest in the arts, whether that's music, film, literature. Um, we have a lot of people who work in creative fields at uh, companies like Spotify, Adobe, uh, The New York Times, um, and they're, they're looking for something else in their life, whether that be a new social network that they're a part of, whether that's something in our programming that speaks to them, but they're basically looking for us to solve um, I mean, a variety of things, and, and hopefully we can do that over the next forever more. <laughs> nice. Yes. And how are you hoping that a space like Ethel's Club will help advance the conversation around POC-centered spaces? Sure. Um, I think that by having a player like us around, it opens up an interesting conversation that was not there before. Um, we've had a lot of other companies like ours kind of appear over the last couple of uh, months, which I think is awesome. I think that people of color are multifaceted and nuanced, and we deserve options. And I think that by us existing, we are allowing for that to happen. Awesome. So I had the opportunity to go to the friends and family opening mm -hmm. over the weekend. And one of the incredible things about the space is pretty much everything there is by a person of color. All the yes. furniture, even the plants, yes. like all that stuff. So I was curious, how hard or easy was that to cultivate in that space? That was the hardest part about all of this, um, trying to find and source curated items from people of color was incredibly difficult, um, but we did it. So if anyone needs a welder, a builder, woodworker, <laughs> um, we, we've done the hard work. Um, but it was important to, uh, to our brand and vision to really build that out. Um, I think that people have responded to the company um, in such a positive way because they believe that we would do that. Um, so as you mentioned, from the art, the food in our cafe, uh, the pillows, plants have all been sourced from people of color. Were you surprised at how difficult it was? No. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, from, from my own personal uh, problems looking for, well, a lot of the company started from me wanting to find a woman of color therapist and being unable to find one. Um, you cannot skew for identity or race on ZocDoc. So it was a lot of trial and error, and I thought, that it would be really interesting if you could go to a place where you could meet with therapists. Mm. Um, when I started thinking about it in sort of a strategic real estate way, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have sort of this rotating door without, uh, not, I'm sorry, with, with not having other things in the space as well. So it grew from there of having therapists and practitioners of color in the space and then a cafe. And then I was like, oh, we'll put some tables. I don't know what this company is anymore. It's totally changing as I speak. <laughs> um, and it, it very organically naturally grew, but Again, the initial state, uh, pain point was not being able to find a uh, person of color in, in therapy. So I was, not, I was not shocked when that was the same thing across different verticals. And speaking of wellness, wellness is one of the main pillars of Ethel's Club. Yes. Why is that important to you in a, a POC-focused space? I think that people of color, well, let me start over. I think that everyone um, should care more about their mental health and, and well-being. I think that people of color specifically have decades, eons of, of trauma that ha have not been adequately dealt with. And so when I thought about creating a space that was joyous and celebratory, the flip side of that is being a safe space where people can really unburden themselves. And I think alongside unburdening comes pain. And to have that 
Um, we needed to be a space that had professionals there to deal with it. Um, so we have a rotating calendar of, I mean, really every practitioner on earth. I learned about so many things when doing this, but from sort of your, your wellness that you'll most likely know about um, to, to mental health therapists and, and different disciplines to consult with our members um, to really open up that world for them. So somebody is always on site at the at the place for the most part. I mean, it's day two. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> so yeah. so we have we've we've set a calendar for November. Um, mm -hmm. So for November, there are therapists on site almost every day. I think except for like one Saturday. Oh wow. Um, and we have different tonight. Actually, in the space, we are having a um, wellness and meditation event um, with a company called Minka, and we are. There's tarot card reading, there's a spiritual cleansing of the space, um, and host of other things. So, so doing things that are outside of the, the norm, if you will, um, trying to educate people about how vast wellness is and what that means. And because of the fact that you started this while searching for your own black therapist, was that always integral? Like you, you knew that you wanted this wellness factor to be one of the key things that happened at Ethel's Club? It wasn't actually. It was one of those things that it was like totally full circle. Like only a few months in, I was like, it'd be really great if I could see a therapist while I was at work. And I was like, wait, <laughs> I have a space and there are going to be other people there and we could totally do that. So it was one of those like very late aha moments. Um, and once it became a part of our narrative, um, it was, everyone was very excited about it. Amazing. Um, so... I saw that you named the club after your late grandmother, yes. correct? So how important is legacy to you, and how important do you think it is for the black community to maintain legacies? Well, for me, um, I think legacy is everything. I, I think that this company is going to be the greatest thing that I'll ever do, and I wanted to make sure that it was rooted in something that meant something, um, that was deep, that could carry on in a way that I felt was compelling. I won't speak for the black community, um, but I, I will say that from what I've heard from people who identify as such is that legacy is also uh, very important. I think that passing on in that way, um, whether it be a company, a name, um, it carries a certain t level of gravity, I think, that you, you take differently or, or more seriously. Um, at least for me, the running joke with my family is like, well, you can't let the company fail. It's named after grandma, you know? <laughs> um, so that's just an additive, like, pressure point. Um, but but for, I, I think it was important. I spent a lot of time thinking about it because we live in the era of hip, cool startup names, and I was really going against the grain, naming it after a family member. But um, I think it was the right decision. How long did it take for you to come up with the name? Exactly 10 minutes. <laughs> wow, all right. Well, I was thinking about, like, I did a whole, like, board of, like, what, you know, what's the vision of the company, what's the brand, it's community, it's kind of family, it almost speaks uh, similar to religion, um, it's a place of comfort, There's, it's wise, it's not too funny. Um, and then when I was looking at all those words and thinking about places that I knew that were similar to that, my grandmother's kitchen kept coming to mind. Um, and so I wanted to, I don't know, that's sort of the spirit of the space. And I don't know if you noticed when you were there, but the interior design is a, a play on sort of modern contemporary art from mm -hmm. people of color, but we have a lot of touches of old. So we have a phone booth that has wallpaper that is um, Essence magazines from the 60s and 70s that we hand ripped out and then <laughs> sent off to someone. Um, we have a curated boutique table of all vintage items um, from a company called Black Market Vintage. So we did a lot of, there are a lot of small nods um, even the, the shape of our pillows. I don't know if you noticed, but it's a specific 60s uh, pillow cutout that our mm. interior designer found. Yeah. Wow. All right. Lots of very unique exactly. touches. Intentional. Going. Yeah, very intentional. I could tell when I was there at the space that you could, you could see the intention in every bit of the space, and particularly when I found out that pretty much everything was made by people of color, it just added to that level of right. intention because you want to know when you're in a space that's meant to be for you sure. that it's you're not surrounded by these other ideas of culture or whatever. And like, it, it really felt like I was immersed into a space that was for me, you know. 
so that good you, yeah you can you can tell <laughs> all that the, hard work yeah you can tell the intention behind that and just knowing those little extra bits of detail is right. really is really incredible so where do you see Ethel's Club in five years I hate this question <laughs> um ideally we'd like many spaces I think that an Ethel's Club can exist everywhere um, we're trying to figure out a way to combine sort of the in real life world with the digital world. Um, I think it's just a compelling way to reach people. I do think there's something about sharing literal space. Um, so I don't know, hopefully a billion dollar company and I, I, like it's successful. You know, I'm like, I don't even know what, what I'm doing on Friday. So it's hard to think about um, five years from now. But I do think that with the start that we've made, um, generally really positive strides from the feedback we've received from our members has been incredible. So around, we'll be around. Around, that's, yeah, yes. that's good, that's good. Um, so last question before we open it up to some audience questions, so prepare yourselves. Uh, so what is something or some things that you were unable to incorporate into the flagship that you'd like to incorporate into future spaces? That's a good question. Um, so we have a wellness uh, room that people can book where we'll have the, that therapy on site. You can also book it for personal meditation, prayer, alone time, screaming. It's soundproof um, for, for that purpose. Um, I would have loved to have a lot of those that were more specific. Um, we have a podcast studio. I would love for that to have been bigger. Um, I would have wanted to do just more, but I think generally with this first space, we managed to do almost everything that was on my hit list, which was great. Um, I'd love for a real performance area. Um, we have a, 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 a calendar of talented musicians coming by and it would be great to sort of give them space in the way that they deserve. So that's definitely on our list for the next space. So would you imagine a, a bigger space? Yes. It's nice. Yeah. It looks cute, you guys, so you guys should check it out. <laughs> Um, so now we are going to open it up to audience questions. This is where you would raise your hand. Yes. So I'm, I'm trying to hear the, the business model. Sure. Or how, I mean, how, how do you hope this to be a going concern and what, what, it, what is the underlying business? Like it, mem memberships or? Yes, it runs like a gym. Like a gym. So, so membership dues is how we make our revenue. Um, because we are tapping a very large demographic that a lot of companies are not tapping. Um, we have a lot of brands who are now looking at us to market and connect with those, those members. Um, so we are having really interesting conversations with people that I never thought I'd be talking to um, who are willing to pay us a lot of money to represent their brand in a genuine way to our, to our audience. But mostly membership dues. Where is it? Uh, it's in East Williamsburg. 315 Meserol Street, Brooklyn, New York, 11206. <laughs> Look at that. So you have to come by. I'll give you a VIP tour. Right. Anybody else? Yes. I'm going to be that person. But compared to spaces like, compared to spaces like um, The Wing or sure. WeWork, what's your annual slash monthly membership? We have two. Um, so we have a house membership that is $195 per month, and that allows you access to the space in all of the ways. We have another membership tier that is $65 a month, and that, act, that gives you access to the space in terms of programming. A lot of what we heard is that people felt that they had their own social networks, but they want it to be around POC, chefs, artists, musicians. Um, so we can give them that that way, and for us as a company, we see it as a potential pipeline, if you will, to get them into the space, have them see how robust the company is, how sick and cool the interior design is, um, and <laughs> they never want to leave. Yes. Um, so I heard that you said it's centered towards people of color. Sure. But um, obviously there's many co-working spaces popping up. Um, so what do you think makes someone take that leap of faith, you know, and say, let me check this out. What's that thing? I think that thing is our brand. We have a very unapologetic, honest brand that differentiates us before we have the product. And for example, we opened on Monday. We have a waiting list of 5,000 people. And that is purely because of who we've shown ourselves to be on the internet. <laughs> so the, the, the easy part was the interior design. Um, the hard part was really cultivating and crafting 
a spirit that people believed in. I think if I were to ask this room, you know, what is the spirit of WeWork, I don't know if it'd necessarily be positive, um, but I don't know if you'd all agree on the same thing. Whereas with Ethel's Club, um, you know, we have that, that waiting list and we've had this eager group of members because we've built something that resonates already. Did that answer your question? You look sort of unsatisfied. <laughs> I, I look forward to seeing it and feeling well, it. Well, I, I guess my, my response would be what what compels anyone to buy anything new ever? You know, it's it's the spirit of that company. It's There are how many startups who have a new toothbrush, shoe, socks? Um, and it's it's because it's funny, it's witty, they have a cool subway ad, your friend gets a 10% discount, et cetera. Um, we are the same thing, right? We're saying we are building something completely different, but it's going to be better and you have to trust us because we know what we're doing. And that's what curation is, so exactly. I look forward to trying it. Great, mm -hmm. thank you. So on that note, yes. what was your criteria for choosing your entire career? Oh, wait, hold on, sorry, we got it. Oh, sorry. Y'all can hear me though, right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, on that note, what was your criteria for choosing the first 150 members? We were looking Congratulations, for a, by the way. Thank I'm you. I'm so excited about Ethel's Club. Thank you, thank <laughs> you. We were looking for a lot of things. It was definitely hard because going through 5,000 applications is a lot. Um, we were looking for people who were looking for community, but were looking to be a part of the community. And that was a really interesting factor once we started, once we put that on the list of things, it was really clear as to who just sort of wanted to be around what was cool and who was willing to kind of put in the work to make sure that it was amazing. Um, so we have a lot of makers and doers, I hate those words, but, but people who are really doing compelling, interesting things, whether it's in Brooklyn or New York City or online, that we felt could make the product better by them being a part of it and in the same room as each other. Back again. What, what's your business training? You sound fairly sophisticated. <laughs> young I've worked at two real estate startups before. So that has uh, gotten me this far. Yeah, the startup world is a whole other beast. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, yes, it is. Nice. Hey there, um, and congratulations. This Thank is you. awesome. Um, I had a question. Um, have there been any like real pain points or mistakes that, I mean, I'm sure there have been many, but any like big ones that stand out where you had like a learning opportunity from it um, in building this business? Um, I wish that I had asked for more money. I think that as a, <laughs> as a black woman raising capital from Silicon Valley, I did not have the confidence that many white men do when they go into the same rooms. And looking back, I'm like, exactly. <laughs> um, I actually was in an investor meeting once and I'm you know, going over my financial model for the one millionth time and I'm deleting cells and making up numbers and I'm taking away my salary and I'm talking with a woman who is, is also a black woman in the VC world and this very excited white dude is walking out and she goes, do you see that guy? I'm like, yeah, and she's like, he just raised three million dollars and he only has an idea. And I was like, but still, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, but, but now that I've done the thing and I've built the product and we are a startup that actually is making money, which most of them do not, and we're making money before we even open doors, and we have this amazing consumer base, um, I still didn't have the confidence, and only now do I see that. And so when I talk to other uh, founders of, from any marginalized community, that's the first thing I tell them, is to ask for more than you need, and you will figure out how to use the money, believe me, it goes very quickly. <laughs> um, so that, that is the one thing that I would have changed. So like all these startups, right? Yes. How do you think you're gonna sustain your, your business? Like, you know, how you keep the people interested? Because sure. it's like a membership basis. Sure. What, 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 should, what will you do to keep them? So I think the thing that we are always thinking of is innovation. And the, the good thing about the base of the company that we've built is that we support emergent artists, which mean that this space is constantly one of innovation and change. Um, I think sort of on a bigger scale in terms of all of the competition, if you will, um, there are not many companies paying attention to people of color as a, as a serious demographic. By 2040, 50% of Americans will identify as such, and there are like 
a handful of companies who are marketing to them. So to, to market to that, that demographic, you have to know them in advance. And we are the preeminent company that knows that market incredibly well today. We're going to know them in a way that is incredibly intimate. They're going to spend their time with us. We, they're going to trust us. And with that trust, we plan on growing the company um, in, a, in a huge manner, but also in a way that stays true to our roots. So I think as long as we can stay the course in that manner, um, well, of half of America, <laughs> which is what I put in my pitch there. And I believe that is all the time we have for Naj. So thank you so much. Of course, thank you. Yeah. So we're going to have DJ Luna Rosa play some tunes. We're going to chill for a little bit, grab another drink, go to the bathroom. I'm going to, you know, pretend to be somebody else. And uh, I'll be back in like five minutes. So thank you guys so much. Stay tuned. <laughs> through your window melting on your skin like honey sweet I lay beside you taking it all in cause I know at any second you gonna change your mind push me away go your own way and leave this all behind think I'm losing all my pride me losing all my pride I think I'm losing all my pride I know no no and I know that we won't last no I can be my truest self you let me see all of your vulnerabilities so was it love or from my tongue no I'm so foolish
Hello, everybody. We are back. Thank you guys so much for coming out to this first iteration of the monthly residency that is the Ciceretta series. Give yourselves a round of applause for coming out. <laughs> Give it up for DJ Luna Rosa on the ones and twos. Also, I don't know if you noticed, but there is incredible artwork by Jasmine Fire out in the front lobby. Please check it out. She is an incredible polymath of an artist, and she has those pieces for sale. So, you know, they're one of a kind. They're the only ones you're going to have. I have a piece in my apartment, and I feel very special. <laughs> But seriously, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Green Space. Thank you, WNYC, for asking me to do this. Um, you know, putting on my curator hat, my Oprah hat. It's a, she wears big hats. I don't know if you've seen the cover of her magazine. Um, so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do some stuff for my upcoming EP. And this is a very big sneak peek because I've only done this in one other place and there were like 10 people there. So, you know. Ooh, let's do the thing. Um, I have a music video coming out on Thursday. Uh, the directors are in the room, as is the designer of this shirt, who is also one of the directors of the music video, so give it up for polymaths, am I right? You can catch this coming out Thursday. Let me get my stuff set up. I'm not used, I, has anybody here seen me perform live before? Woo. Yes, okay, so like not many of you, awesome. Cause usually I like do this acapella thing with just a loop pedal and now my new stuff involves like a computer and this Ableton push and a new foot pedal. And so there are a lot more chords involved and I'm trying to grow more hands and also make it look like I know what I'm doing. So, you know, we're gonna do that now, all right? So, this is some new stuff from you and I. Let me get my laptop open. Yes, okay, let's see. Thank you guys again, I appreciate it. Woo, all right.
How you doing? How you feeling? You guys with me? Yeah?
No Room music video coming out on Thursday. Give it up for everybody on stage tonight. Woo! Marie Faustin, Melissa McMillan, Naj Austin. My name's Madison McFerrin. The Nexus Soretta series is December 3rd. See you there.